So yeah, like Brandon mentioned, this is roughly designed to be a follow-up to his talk. Um, I did take some, some time to talk about things in a slightly different way. Um, keep in mind, I'm also not an expert. I'm not Ed Komet. I'm not Brian McKenna. I'm not uh, all these people that you would think about as uh, functional programming experts. I mean, I've been working with it for quite some time, uh, but I'm definitely not uh, the master. So um, about me, I'm Colt Fredrickson. I uh, work at Oracle. Uh, we got bought up by them a few years ago. Um, I work on a big data, there you go, drop that word, uh, team. And we, we do some interesting stuff with Scala. Um, I've been working in Scala since 2011. Originally, I started writing it as better Java. Uh, you know, because it's, it is. <laughs> it's, it's way better than Java, even if you just write it like Java. Uh, but then once you start getting into these problems like Brendan's talking about, uh, where you want error messages and you want to combine failures and all this stuff, uh, you do run into some interesting things. Um, so ask questions. If at any point you're confused about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it, uh, just stop me. This is not designed to be, uh, I'm going to go all the way through to the end and then there's, like, ask a question about something at the beginning. If, if on the way it doesn't make sense, please just stop me. Um, so Scala Z is um, just functional programming language or functional programming library for Scala. It's basically trying to take um, principal data structures and that kind of stuff and use them in Scala. Now, what typically happens when you show somebody Scala Z is roughly this. Like, <laughs> like, you walk up to a standard Scala developer who uses this as a better Java, and they just like, what are you even saying to me? Because they run into stuff like this. Like, Modad trans of f of higher kinded this and this, and it takes arbitrary types, and they, they send you a chat message that says, I have no idea what this means or how it's useful. And so, you, you know, that's, that's not really what you want uh, people to be dealing with. Or this, where it's like, okay, it's a function from A to B, but look at that type. Like, look at the symbols. Like, if somebody doesn't understand lambdas and alphas in the first place, uh, in any sort of category theory or, or something like that, they'll just be like, I, I, don't, I don't want this. Um, so really, it, it's not that bad. Uh, it's, it certainly is filled with symbols, and it certainly is backed by theory, but you can pick little it's, itsy bitsy pieces off and use it without like biting off a monad trans right off the bat. Like you don't have to you don't have to deal with that. Um, so before we talk about all those uh, data structures and type classes, let's call the package structure is is a very uh, interesting beast. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through it and talk about it. Uh, and hopefully you can, I'll, I'll tweet out these slides afterwards, and you can come back to it and kind of use it. Um, so all data types are underneath Scala-Z um, base package. So like even the type classes like functor, uh, monad, et cetera, are under there, uh, as well as uh, Clisely, non-empty list, et cetera. Um, so if you want them all, you can import Scala-Z underscore, and you'll get all the data types uh, from Scala-Z. Um, but if you want them, you can import them individually. Um, so syntax. A lot of what Scala-Z offers is the stuff that Brendan was talking about with like star greater than or pipe at pipe, pinky pie, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you can get that syntax uh, by importing um, the data type dot underscore. So for if you want to put either syntax onto your standard data types, so you can put like dot left to lift something into a left side of a disjunction or dot right. You just import Scala Z syntax um, either underscore. Also note that it's wildly confusing that it's either or not disjunction when everybody calls it disjunction, but that's the way it is. Uh, same thing with equal. Like if you import equal dot underscore, you get um, an implicit def that basically converts anything that has a equal type class into something that has syntax for triple equals and equal slash equals, um, which is a more safe uh, tape site way of dealing with equality. And the same thing with functor, adds map and uh, map to your um, stuff that has a functor type class. Um, or, like I said, you can just get them all. So you will run into the scenarios where um, you're starting to develop in a file and you don't know what you need from Scala Z. So 
If you start with the import scala z dot underscore scala z dot underscore and just like work in there, but I try to avoid personally committing that unless I'm, if I really am leveraging a lot of things, I'll, I'll switch to like, well, I'm getting it all, but otherwise I like to put comments about why certain imports are there for just to help out my coworkers really. Um, so you can also get syntax for uh, standard library stuff. Um, so a lot of what Scala Z also does is add syntax to um, standard library classes, like intersperse on list or, I don't know, there's a bunch of other examples. Um, so you can also get standard library syntax stuff from uh, the syntax.std. Uh, whatever package. Um, and then you get type class instances from Scala Z, STD, uh, and then the type name dot underscore. Um, so all this is really um, a little bit confusing. And so our, uh, there's a friendly guy, C Dubs, Cody. Uh, he has a flow chart for this. That's how complicated it is. So this flow chart is uh, at this URL, which I'll, I'll tweet out. But uh, he was ultimately responsible for that. And so you just start at the top, and it'll let you be like, well, what am, I, what am I looking for? What kind of error messages am I getting? That kind of thing. And it'll walk you through what to import. Um, it's kind of sad that we need that, but at the same time, things are split up. OK, so let's dig in. We're going to talk about a couple types. We already talked a little bit about non-empty list. We're going to get into a little more. And then we're going to talk about type classes. Um, so I said I was going to talk about non-empty list. I kind of am. Uh, there's a, there's a, a type called one and. And it's parameterized on a type f. And that this allows you to say, I have at least one value of, of type a, and then I have a tail of values that are in some type f. So when you think about naturally a list, uh, like you have a head and a tail, obviously this fits really well, where the, you know, the, the head is that type a, and the tail is uh, the list. Um, so you can define non-empty list in terms of one and. Uh, Scala Z didn't. Um, I think it's probably because they just wanted to put a bunch more functionality on there and not expose out uh, that type. Um, it's also, uh, I did note that uh, one and is invariant, and a non-empty list is not invariant. So that might also be the reason. Um, one and also doesn't quite work correctly. Uh, they're, they're fixing that. But it's, okay. it, it, it doesn't actually work correctly to the extent that now can be defined in terms of that. So that's part of why it's okay. Uh, sure. Oh, OK. So yeah, in 7.2, there's variance on, uh, is there invariant? Invariant, yeah. It may not empty list invariant? Yeah, I broke the capital. You're a bad person. OK, so non-empty list. This is the point at which I, <laughs> if you have a list that you know isn't empty, and you return out the list type anyways, you're just being a bad person to your consumers. <laughs> You're basically saying to your consumers in a comment or whatever, hey, I guarantee this list won't be empty. Uh, it's safe to call head on it. And then they end up in, if they're following any kind of style guideline, they're going to have like a head with a comment that says, I'm sorry, future me. Uh, really, this is safe. <laughs> it's like, we have types for a reason. Let's use them. OK, soapbox. Uh, soapbox <laughs> over. <laughs> so uh, non-empty list. Um, there's two constructors we're going to talk about. So the there's basically just, if you pass in the head and um, some list is the tail, and then there's a var args version of that that allows you to pass in any number of arguments and it'll make it into a list. Um, but it's exactly what you'd expect out of the operators. Like, there's a maximum by, there's a minimum by, there's all kinds of list functionality on there. Um, as well as, you can see here, I mean, the, the head is a value. Like, it's not a def that'll throw an exception in some cases. It's not partial in any kind of way. It is a value. You know it, use it. Um, and so if you're desperate and something um, you're going to call into needs a list, it's a constant of time operation. Just call dot list on your non-empty list, and you'll get back the list. So you could pass it off. And then sure, when you get it back, like, OK, maybe you have to do that ugly thing where you pattern match and like, well, this, this should never happen, but I had to do this because of whatever reason. If we all agree <laughs> that non-empty lists are a thing, then we could just stop uh, you know, having functions that only operate on list. Um, so non-empty list. Um, I just wanted to give like, some examples of where this is a really good idea. Um, so in Addo, which is a thing uh, Rob wrote, 
uh, parser library, there's the ability to parse uh, match many of a particular parser. So I'll match 0 to n matches of that parser. And it still succeed if there's 0. If, you're, if you want to have at least one, the return type should be non-empty list, because we know that there's at least one. Like, so there's none of this magic where we have to figure out, when I call many one, is, was there one for sure? I know there was, because that's what the documentation said. But now the type says it too. Um, so let's see. I don't know what I lost here. OK. So here's another interesting thing. So say that you have a thing called validate users. Like Brandon was talking about validating users. Um, so we, here we have something that takes a list of users and returns you a, a validation of non-empty list of errors, like we were talking about, or a list of users. Well, is an empty list of users a reasonable thing to validate? Are we saying for our particular use case that empty list is valid? If we are, then that's the, the data type is entirely precise. But if we're not, and we actually said you have to have at least one user, the second type is right. So it, it's just try to, try to be as precise as possible with your type to help out your users. So it's all about precision. If you're, if you're talking about your types, um, we have types. Let's use them. Uh, be precise. So let's talk about validation. Uh, we just got done talking about it a bunch. But it, it looks just like a disjunction. Right? There, there, there's the left. That's a failure. There's a right. Success. It's, it's not entirely obvious uh, at first glance why it is what it is. Um, so you get some operations on um, validation. Uh, we just talked about validation NEL. Uh, that's just uh, conversion. Um, disjunction, they're completely isomorphic to each other. It's always like, safe to go from a validation to a disjunction and back to a validation. So if you need to, uh, for instance, use it as a monad, a flat map over it, you can just convert it to a disjunction, use it in that fashion, and then convert it back at the end. Do note that you'll lose uh, the error accumulation um, on it when you do that because you've converted it to a uh, disjunction, but you can do that if you need to. So this is another place where, sure, it would be inconvenient if you couldn't do these isomorphisms um, easily, but if you can do these isomorphisms, there's just no reason to not be precise about what, you were, what you're doing. So if you're doing validation, use a validation. Go. I was going to say, just make a point about the whole like applicative versus flat mapping kind of things with errors. It, it really comes down to what does your error handling want to be? Is it halt on first error, or is it right. accumulate? Yep. So just something to keep in mind. Yep, and you might switch between those in your domain. Like at Brendan's lower level, you might want to accumulate all these low-level errors, but at the top level, you want to fail as fast as possible. So you can switch between these two. You don't have to choose. They're isomorphic to each other. So it's not a monad. <laughs> so the first time you try to use it in a fork comprehension, you get the error that you can't. Just, just don't be too sad. Um, so here's just a couple examples. And I use the uh, Pinkie Pie uh, syntax here. Um, but and, and we don't even need to really go into these because we talked about it a bunch in the last um, section. But basically, it's just accumulating errors on the left. And it's um, giving, or calling the function with the success values if it was a success. So. Uh, I don't really, yeah, I, like that, that's all I have to say about um, the actual data types. Does anybody have any question about the data types before we move on to type classes? Perfect. All right. So before we go any further, uh, I just want to take a brief aside. Everybody here probably knows uh, type class syntax, uh, but it can get a little weird if you haven't dealt with this before. So. Functor, in this particular case, is um, a type class over some uh, higher kind of type f. So that's just saying a type that has, uh, needs another type before it's actually a full type. Um, and so what, what we're saying here is list instance is defined over just list. It's not defined over list of a or list of a specific type. It's defined for all lists, regardless of what's in it. Um, and then the a's come in in the actual functions. So map is defined for any list of A given a function of from A to B. Um, so Daniel has a talk from quite some time ago uh, 
high, uh, wizardry in the land of Scala about higher kind of types. Um, so if you don't know about higher kind of types and you want to learn about them, uh, I do recommend that talk. It was like basically four, three years ago or something crazy now. Um, but I, I think he does a good job talking about t what higher kind of types are and, and why they're useful um, and just the terminology that surrounds them. So. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I think most of the talk is just like star to star to star. So there's, there's a lot of stars in there. Um, so let's talk about the semi-group type class. Um, this is a type class that's just saying you can add things together. Um, so the reason it's not called like additive is because, I mean, addition is also commutative. And there's like, there's a bunch of other stuff. The only laws that are, deal with, um, you deal with when you're talking about a semi-group is associativity. So you've got to be able to add together A and B to C, and then you know, A and B, or A to B and C. Like, that's, that's the only law, the only way it has to work. And there is such a thing as a commutative semigroup, uh, if, if that's the kind of restriction you need. It doesn't exist today um, in Scala Z. I've, I've talked to Lars a little bit about it, but I haven't talked to him since like, the whole uh, switcheroo. <laughs> so. Uh, <coughs> semigroup. This is a. There's some really interesting things that you get from semigroup, and this is just one of them. Um, I defined a little uh, thing here that is wildly useful to me a lot of times, where if I want to update um, a value inside of a map, and if if there is a value in there, I want to append my new value to it. If there's not, I just want to put it in there. Um, this is something we want to do all the time. Like here, I I've probably written this function like 100 times before I discovered this uh, over different types before I understood how I could uh, do it better. So all I did was say B has to be a semi-group, and it'll uh, work for any map uh, A to B. And that little bar plus bar, I'm going to leave it to Brendan to name it, um, <laughs> but it's basically the uh, syntax for append. So I could have said append there. Um, now it's obvious I had to have the syntax and scope and all that stuff. I didn't show the imports here. But so if I append a map where the keys line up, it just adds together those two lists in the value. So the, the semi-group for list is just appending. And the second one, like you can see since the keys are different, it obviously just put the first value in there. Um, so that's all I have to talk about with semi-group. It's fairly simple. Monoid is just the semi-group, but there's a zero that you can put in anywhere. Think of zero as like, uh, the zero for addition, uh, or the one for product on numbers. Identity, right? Identity. Yeah, they call it zero. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so it's a, this is a great problem, where zero is, is the identity. And they probably should have called it that, but they didn't. Um, so there's the, there's the laws. I don't think we need to go into them. Um, so it, it gives you a few simple things. Uh, multiply just appends a, a value together n times. Yeah. Um, you, you'll run into a lot of cases where you're going to want to check to see if something is the identity or not. Um, and then you've got the if empty, if it is the identity, do something special. Um, but the, the power from monoids does not come from using them by themselves. It's what you get from them when you uh, put that together. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's just some instances of um, monoids. Uh, you'll find them everywhere <laughs> once you start thinking about things like this. Uh, being able to add data structures together is almost all of what we normally do as uh, software engineers. Like we're, we're, we're fiddling bits. Uh, that's basically our job. So uh, here's, a, um, here's an example of uh, something that I wish that I had a lot of times is better sum. It's basically for anything that could be added together that has an identity, I want to sum it. If you try to call sum on something um, in the, uh, on traversable once, and it's not numeric, like you'll get a, an, a compile error. And that's not what I want. I want to be able to add together uh, strings, and I want to be able to add together options of values, and I want to be able to add together all these different types of things. Um, so here's a really fascinating one that, that I find wildly useful, is being able to add together maps. Uh, so you can add together maps where it's for wherever the key is equal, it's going to add together the value for you. 
We just talked about that a little bit in the last one where you want to update a single element. But if, what if you just want to merge two maps? That's something that, like I end up wanting to do quite a, quite a bit when I get back, something that looks like JSON, I'm storing it in a map in memory. Uh, I just want to add together those values and then I'll turn it back into JSON or whatever. So uh, map is a monoid if the values can be appended. So that's just saying if you have a semi-group for your value, you can add together uh, maps. And that's an example here where A, in the first example, 2 and 3 got added together. In the second example, it didn't. So I, I, f I find like the monoids are just so useful. Uh, you'll run into this all the time once you start thinking about it. Anytime you can add two things together, think, well, if I just made this a monoid, like, what, am I, what would I get out of Scala Z for free uh, being, able to, being able to leverage that? So you'll see it all over the place now. Um, the next one I want to talk about, we're going to take a pretty significant jump in terms of mental uh, energy expended <laughs> from uh, monoid, but foldable is, is a wildly useful um, type class. So you have to implement either fold map or fold write. Uh, I'm not going to talk about fold write um, right now. Uh, I'd like to think about it in terms of fold map. Because then it's basically like map reduce. Um, so fold map, you're, you have some container thingy, f, and you have some function that goes from a to b, and you have the ability to add together b's. That's all this is saying. If you do that, what are we talking about here? I mean, we are talking about map reduce. You map, then you collapse it all into one value. Um, and so it turns out this this comes up all the time. Um, there's no laws per se, except for the consistency laws. Um, I, I somehow I went back to the pa original paper, and it seems like there should be one more law, but I haven't uh, spent any time working on it. So um, this gives you the ability to like do things like length on some data structure, um, convert it to uh, lists and sequences and sets, minimums and maximums. Um, I'm going to mention fold map M here uh, because it's so cool once you see, see that you need a use for it. Um, but that's just going to some value uh, g, which is a monad. Um, just, just if you start, if you start uh, ending up in a place where the value you're using inside of your fold maps are uh, monads, maybe this is what you want. Um, just start poking at it and come uh, bother us on IRC uh, when you run into that problem. Um, so, Give a couple examples. I'm going to give examples mainly in terms of uh, collection-y things, uh, because that's what most people think of and what most people can derive good uh, uses for. Um, but any structure that be, can be collapsed into a single value uh, in a consistent way is foldable. So you could run into some in places where this is uh, worthwhile in something you have yourself that's holding on to values. Um, so fold map of identity over integers is the exact same as if I just folded left, seeded the, the fold left with the identity, and then accumulated the values from left to right. It's, it's exactly the same. So now we've got, if we've got a list of maps, like we talked about before, maps are a monoid if the value is a semigroup. So you can fold over this list of maps if you want to accumulate the values at the, where the keys are the same. Now, you might run into an issue where you're like, well, that's not what I wanted at all. What I really wanted was I want to sum up all the values inside of the maps. So you, you can compose foldable structures into a foldable structure that's bigger. So if you have a list of maps, you can collapse the maps together. But if you want, you can create a foldable structure that operates over the list of map and just fold over the values. So this is really neat when you uh, come into this place where um, you want to ignore all the values or ignore the keys in the map and just collapse all the values together. So here I went, I composed, uh, I, I summoned a foldable of list. I composed that with a map, uh, foldable for map of string to some value. And here I'm using. Uh, not the super ugly syntax of symbols for uh, that type, 
I'm using kind projector, which if you deal with higher kind of types at all, you should probably take a look at. Um, but then I fold map over that, that list of maps up top. And just in, for a change of pace, instead of doing uh, just the identity function, I added 100 to each value. So what this does is it takes 101 plus 102 plus 103 and returns you the value. So it, sometimes it's hard to see that this is what you really want because you've written this deeply nested code that kind of looks like uh, a rat's nest. Uh, and all you wanted to do was just pull out the values and add them together. Um, so sometimes when you have something super nested and, and ugly, stop, think, okay, could this be solved with something uh, so, uh, slightly better? Where's the question mark yeah. in the type signature? Sure. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> it's a hole. Uh, so that's to say uh, foldable structures, if you remember, are defined over f of underscore. So you can't fully specify a type. You have to, you have, to have a hole in your data type uh, where, you want, where you want to uh, um, declare your foldable structure over. This is using, I could have used, uh, you remember on the first slide where Pinkie Pie is vomiting herself up? Uh, I could use some super um, ugly syntax like that. This is a, using a Kapower plugin called Kind Projector that allows you to forego the ugly syntax and just use a question mark. Stu might talk about that kind of stuff when he talks about cats, because uh, they use kind projector uh, all over the place. Yeah, you can kind of think of the question mark there as filling in the type of the list, where it has foldable list. Yeah. It's, it could be a type alias, too, you could say. Yeah, you, yep. you did. I could have done that, and I maybe should have. Or you could write big lambda. Yeah, I think I'll avoid the lambda if I can. <laughs> um, Not hardcore enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, more specifically, I, I don't like scaring people away. <laughs> um, so. We've talked about foldable, which takes a structure, uh, some big structure, and collapses it down into one value. Now let's talk about traverse. And if you look at the Haskell stuff, uh, it says traversable, uh, but that's uh, kind of taken by some of the Scala standard stuff. So they, they chose to just go, go with traverse. Um, but basically, this goes from some structure. And for every function in there, you're going to some other value. Um, some other applicative value, like validation is a good example, or uh, disjunction, or option. And see the return type at the end there, g of f of b? So we went, for each element in our f, we're going from an a to a g of b. And we're basically constructing one big f of g of b's, and we're f then just going to flip that structure inside out. So the first time I saw this, uh, I couldn't believe that it was a thing, and I couldn't make any sense of it. So just, just think about it as the thing you probably always want. Uh, <laughs> <when> you, <laughs> it is true. It, it's almost always the right answer. It's, it's, if, you are, if you have a list of things you're going to validate, and you go over it and you create a list of validations, almost what you want is a validation of list, because you want all your successes together, or you want that failure. So let's just dig into some. Uh, some examples. So first, I'm going to talk about <laughs> this super ugly thing that exists. Um, so Scala C isn't the best at uh, type inferring higher kind of types. Um, so actually, let's just say that it can't. Let's just say it can't. Uh, so the clever people in Scala Z and uh, they invented these weird unapply, super ugly things. Um, I only put it up here almost for like laughability's sake. Uh, don't pay attention to the, these versions um, in terms of the type signatures, but always use them. <laughs> <laughs> almost always what you want is traverse u instead of traverse impl uh, because the type inference on, in Scala C is bad. Uh, it's just the way it is. Just use them, but be afraid. Be very afraid. Sorry, you're saying that that's what we should use as an end user, not when we implement our own traverse. Correct. Yeah. Yep. You implement traverse impl. So you get to implement it in terms of that nice type signature. Um, now, the unapply things that, we, that are in this slide um, only exist for the most common shapes. Oh, God. But. I haven't run into an instance 
especially in the in the gateway drug like casual user where you're not hardcore into finding your own traversable types, uh, you will you will have much deeper knowledge of this stuff before you have to create your own um, just using what's there. So just don't pay attention to the type signature, use it, and uh, come bother people uh, if you if you have problems. This is basically like what, what's going on there is basically the, the very tip of the shapeless iceberg. Yeah, there, there's. If you, if you start going down that path, you will land in shapeless. And, yeah, exactly. That. <laughs> there will be a lot of yelling, uh, mostly fear. Um, so let's talk about this. I said it's what you almost always want, and it is. So if I if I map over some function, just pretend that i plus 100 uh, could fail in some case. And I, oh, we'll talk about it on the next line. But I if I go across that and I map it, I end up with a list of option of int. Well. That's probably not what you want. I mean, if you, it is what you want, sweet. You're, you're covered already. But if you call this sequence u on the end, it'll flip that structure inside out. So you can see on the second um, line, instead of getting back a list that has some failures and some successes, you get back just the failure. And then you can fold on it, pattern match on it, do whatever you want uh, with that option on the outside. Um, so traverse u is just map plus sequence u. So if you find yourself mapping and then calling sequence u, you can just replace the map with a traverse u and delete the sequence u. It's actually a lot more common than sequence u. Yeah. It, you're almost always mapping. Anyway. Right. You're almost always mapping anyways. Um, but I, find, I found myself when I first started using this stuff, I would just write the map and be like, oh, I need to flip this thing inside out, tack the sequence u onto the end. And then you're like, oh, I see this common pattern. I could do it in one call instead of two. So this is just the same code. Um, I just replaced the map with the traverse u and got rid of the sequence u, uh, like I mentioned. OK, so um, validation is where this typically comes up. You're validating a list of things, uh, and you want to get back all the failures, or you want to get back the success. Um, so I defined just a type alias, uh, validation of non-empty list of string. Uh, and then I valid validate user returns on my validation of user. So it takes some string and presumably creates some user out of it. Um, so in this case, I end up with, I've got list, Colt, Fred, Bob, bunch of symbols, and let's say symbols are, are not valid. Uh, so I get back a failure that has a non-empty list with both of the error messages in it. So I accumulated all the errors, or I would have gotten back the user, which I, is the success. So you're either going to get back a failure with all your errors, which is a non-empty list, because you know that there's an error in there if you're getting back the left side or the failure side, or you would get back uh, the user. So if you look at the uh, scenario where there is just valid users, you get back a success uh, with lists of users. So also note, like, you're, we're talking about your, va your validation code is still written in, in terms of a single user, so you can unit test it. Um, really nicely, but then you can uh, comprehend across it or traverse across it using this nice traverse you thing to accumulate lots of successes or lots of failures. So that is it. Thank you.